Hi, my name is Dr. Joshua Stockley. I want to thank you for attending today's forum on coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. We have with us today a panelist intended to be three individuals. Unfortunately, our third panelist, Dr. Luther, is unable to join us today, but we still have with us Dr. Courtney Robertson. She is a clinical assistant professor at the College of Pharmacy. And we also have with us Ms. Ashley Wilcher, she is an assistant professor at the Kitty Degree School of Nursing. Collectively, our panelists are going to be talking about the coronavirus, the latest updates, how it spread, and some preventative measures that we can take to prevent its spread. We will also address community concerns and discuss the vaccine for coronavirus and the development for a treatment. Prior to after their presentations, we will take questions from the audience. If you are with us on the ULM YouTube channel, you can also submit your questions from there and we'll be more than happy to make our effort, best efforts to answer them. With that being said and without further delay, we will now start with Dr. Courtney Robertson. Ms. Wilcher. Okay. Do you want to start? Sure. Okay. I'm Ashley Wilcher. I'm an adult gerontology primary care nurse practitioner, and we are just doing an update. So as of 930 this morning, there are 171 COVID-19 cases and four deaths in Louisiana. As of now, there are no t uh, cases in Washita Parish. So COVID-19 is spread from person to person through coughing and sneezing. The virus carrying airborne droplets can remain in the air or on surfaces even after the ill person is no longer present. Symptoms typically include fever, running nose, dry cough, shortness of breath, fatigues, and body aches. These symptoms are very common right now. It's Louisiana, we have allergies, we still have flu season. Um, so if you are experiencing symptoms, call your healthcare provider first. A lot of offices are locking the front door and have a sign on the door to call and they'll triage you whether or not they're gonna see you. Prevention goes a long way. So wash your hands often with soap and water. If there's no soap and water available, hand sanitizer as long as it's 60% or more alcohol content. Social distancing. Stay at home if you are sick. Cover your coughs and sneezes with tissues or inside of your elbow. Avoid touching your face. I think this is the hardest thing. I didn't realize how much I touched my face until I'm telling people do not touch your face. Um, don't wear face masks unless you are sick or caring for someone who is sick. Clean and disinfect all surfaces. Older adults and those with comorbidities such as diabetes or lung disease are more at risk. So I've had some community concerned questions that I've been asked, so I have those down today. What is social distancing? So I think everybody knows what that is, but avoid large gatherings. So in here, we have less than 10 people. Um, keep six feet between you. Use your common sense. Don't go to the movies, which now that's been shut down. Um, avoid gatherings of 10 or more. And you've heard flattening the curve. Well, what does flattening the curve mean? It means it is preventing the surge in illness from people staying away from each other. So we are not going to overwhelm our healthcare system. There's no need to panic. Just be cautious. Use common sense. No hugs or handshakes. Do air high fives. Um, as far as the university, we have converted our face-to-face -face courses to online courses. That way, we're encouraging social distancing. There have been numerous events, church services, um, conferences that have been canceled due to uh, protecting our most vulnerable populations. What if I'm sick? Can I still go to the doctor? Um, I watched an update this morning and they're talking about expanding telemedicine. So some of the clinics locally have started doing more telemedicine. So call the clinic and see if, you know, they want you to try and come in or if they can assess your symptoms and treat you through the phone or through FaceTime. Is there a chance that my dog may get or can spread COVID-19 to me? As of now, the CDC is stating that no, pets are not transmitting um, COVID-19. So what is the difference between isolation and quarantine? So if someone is isolated, they have, they are sick. If you are in quarantine, you are a person who has been exposed. So I'm stuck at home with my kids, can we get out of the house? 
well, we're not going out to eat right now, so if you want to go out to eat, you've got to go through a drive-through, and as hard as it is, we need to slow down, back up, and stay home. Um, that doesn't mean get your, you know, three best friends together and all their kids. So as hard as it is, stay home. Unless there is a need to leave your house, do not. Avoid gathering in public places. What if I'm exposed to COVID-19 and I'm on a 14-day quarantine? Who gets to visit me? Nobody. To keep it from spreading or the potential of spread, quarantine means quarantine. So if you traveled to a country that, if you could fly back in and it was somewhere that had COVID-19, you have 14 days of a long time. Um, it's just helping our vulnerable pop populations not get it. Am I going to run out of groceries or toilet paper? No, the stores are stocking, they are lowering their hours. So Walmart is now decreasing, they're no longer 24 hours, but they're using that time to clean and stock the shelves. So if you go buy groceries, be mindful of others and make sure that you're not buying three months worth of groceries or essentials. They have guaranteed, um, according to the news brief this morning, they have guaranteed that they are not going to run out. Um, Dr. Robertson. Thank you, Dr. Wilcher. Um, we're here, as Dr. Wilcher said, to um, stress the importance of prevention of COVID-19, not to add to any panic that we've seen through social media, through other um, outlets, particularly media, radio, um, memes that are there traveling around, some rumors circulating. Uh, we want to add to prevention rather than um, the pandemonium and panic surrounding this pandemic. And another question that I've received recently is what is the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic? A uh, pandemic is when we see the spread of a disease virus on a global level, and that's where we're at. Um, currently, the, the CDC and World Health Organization did declare it a pandemic as of last week, and the cases are continuing to rise, and that is why the term social distancing is so very important right now. Um, it is not only to protect ourselves, but to potentially protect those at the highest risk of severe complications from this infection. While mild um, symptoms occur for most, as Dr. Wilcher covered, um, there are some underlying medical conditions that increase the risk of serious COVID-19 for individuals of any age. And I'm going to review those. Um, those patients who have certain blood disorders such as sickle cell disease or those patients who are taking blood thinners for certain uh, medical conditions, chronic kidney and liver disease. And so those are defined by your doctor and those have been diagnosed by um, patients, physicians. Any type of immunosuppression or compromised immune system, so patients who may be seeing a doctor for cancer, receiving uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy, um, certain individuals who have had organ or bone marrow uh, transplants, or taking high doses of steroids for certain medical conditions. These may lead to immunosuppression and should be uh, cautious and look forward to that self-isolation so they may pr protect themselves. Also, patients who are currently or have been recently pregnant within the last two weeks um, are at greater risk. Those with endocrine disorders such as uh, thyroid disease or diabetes, uh, metabolic disorders, any type of heart and lung disease based on the symptoms um, we see with COVID-19 thus far, the inflammation caused in the respiratory system can lead to greater complications for those who already have some type of heart or lung condition that they've been diagnosed with, and any type of neurological, neuro uh, development condition. So that might be failure to thrive, some type of intellectual disability, uh, developmental dis delay or spinal cord injury. Again, these are the patients who are greatest risk for severe complications of COVID-19 um, and who we have seen in our country as well as other countries have the most uh, complications. As far as preventative measures, we can't stress those enough. So um, washing those hands for at least 20 seconds, um, and that is happy birthday twice. You can find other lists um, of songs or um, prayers, 
quotes that you can go through that last that 20 seconds, and it's a helpful reminder, especially for our kids. Um, happy birthday two times, and um, mine particular right now are very used to singing it, and um, keeping hands away from mouth, nose, face. Um, I read one statistic says that a human touches their face on average 90 times, um, which I had no idea until, like Dr. Wilcher said, uh, when you're not trying to touch your face, you realize how difficult it is not to. Um, Self-isolation and social distancing are so very important as well right now. I'm going to to reiterate that and re-emphasize. Um, it is not, as I've read from some social media comments and other concerns um, from individuals, well, why are we being told we can't go places? Why are we being told we can't go to a restaurant or go to the movies or um, gather in groups of more than 10? This is a protective measure to keep yourselves and keep these at risk safe um, from infection and to start narrowing and limiting, lowering that curve so that we see a decreased number of cases rather than a continued increase. Um, there have been questions as far as treatment for COVID-19. Currently, there is no approved um, treatment outside of the preventative measures for COVID-19. Um, these are supportive measures provided by uh, medical institutions as well as the things you can do at home for supportive therapy, getting rest, getting enough hydration. Um, as far as vaccines, there have been questions, do we have a vaccine yet? There have been expedited processes taken in order to develop a vaccine. Uh, the general timeline for development is a year to 18 months, and in some cases, it may take a decade for a vaccine for um, vaccine pre preventable diseases to be developed. So that decade includes development of the vaccine all the way through phase one, two, three trials, and then approval from the FDA um, for sale of that medicine. And so currently we have a phase one clinical trial that has um, been initiated in Seattle. It has been designed, this vaccine, to protect against COVID-19. Um, it has started at Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute in Seattle. Um, this trial is funded by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is part of the National Institute of Health. Um, this open trial will include 45 um, healthy adult volunteers ages 18 to 55 years of age over a course of about six weeks. And so the first participant um, actually started or received the investigational vaccine yesterday. And what they're doing in this phase one is looking at different experimental doses of the vaccine to see what's going to be best at preventing um, replication of the virus within the body and cause an immune response. So our bodies will start prevent, uh, producing antibodies uh, to COVID-19. Also, we're looking at safety um, of the vaccine as well in this uh, different dose and in this phase one. So really it's about safety and how well that will work before we can move on to using it in more patients. Um, but I'm very pleased at the expedited process in this vaccine development and getting these phase one trials started um, sooner rather than later. Do we have any questions from the live stream? None. Do any of our audience members have a question? Will that really the difference between isolation and quarantine? Okay. So the question was um, the difference between isolation and quarantine. So if you are put into isolation, that is reserved for someone who does have the illness. So quarantine is if you travel to New Orleans as an outbreak right now. So if you travel to New Orleans, when you come back, you would need to self-quarantine. So for 14 days, you're in your house by yourself, just away in case you might have come in contact with the virus. So isolation is what we're doing to the patients in the hospital, and then quarantine is at your house. You're just staying away for good measure. Yes, ma'am.
No, it's up to four deaths right now, and I do not know of pre-existings. Do you? As far as I know, those details haven't been released for underlying chronic conditions the patients had previously to their COVID-19 infection. Any other questions? The surface life of the infection, that was the, inque the, that was the question, how long can COVID-19 live on um, surfaces? As far as we know at this time, on metal surfaces such as, you know, doorknobs, um, other inanimate objects, we're looking at a week. Survival time has been the estimate, um, potentially longer in air. Um, so it has been theorized or, or put out by CDC that you don't have to be within three feet or six feet of an individual who coughs or sneezes. Um, those respiratory droplets containing COVID-19 um, virus could remain in the air for um, an undetermined amount of time. And so um, that is the push for self-isolation. If you've been in contact with anybody who has been infected with COVID-19 virus, um, who has had a positive diagnosis or suspects they may have any symptoms related to the virus itself. And the previous question, I'm sorry I did not repeat it. Um, it was related to do we know the cr uh, chronic underlying conditions of the estimated up to four deaths we've had in Louisiana and, and to our knowledge, um, those have not been released yet for those individuals. So the question was for our students, could we possibly reiterate the importance of social distancing um, to prevent the spread of the virus as well as infection, um, positive uh, cases that we see? It is absolutely imperative, I feel in my opinion, and Dr. Wilcher will agree with me, um, social distancing is you know, up there with washing of hands. Um, our government, our, our local and uh, federal health departments, um, CDC and World Health Organization have all backed this social distancing to prevent not only um, the spread of the, the virus and, and illness itself, but to protect our at-risk populations. And, and there are quite a few. That list of um, populations and group at highest risk for severe complications has grown exponentially over, um, I would say, the last week. They have added to those groups, CDC and World Health Organization, from the cases and the complications they've seen around the world as well as here in the U.S. Um, and this is unprecedented. We have not um, dealt with this type of um, pandemic or this level of preventative measures from a government and um, CDC standpoint, um, but it is very important. And I don't think that we, our students, um, our society should take them lightly or feel that it doesn't apply to them. Well, I'm sick, I haven't had any um, symptoms of this virus or I, I haven't had symptoms of any illness. Well, we can be carriers regardless of our symptoms, and symptoms may not show up for at least two weeks. Um, it, our incubation period is suspected to be up to two weeks, and incubation period means that we could be carrying a virus or another infection um, and be spreading that to others but not show any signs of infection up to that time. And so for students, uh, that was a roundabout way to, to get back to our students, but um, if they are in close quarters, practice that social distancing. This is, this is hard right now. I know K through 12 schools are out. Um, we've gone to an online only format, which we haven't dealt with. Life as we know it right now is new and different, um, but we can adapt to change. And I feel like at this time that we have to do that in order to keep ourselves and others safe. Okay, so besides washing the hands, college students, they drink after each other, they share everything. So right now, it's 
you know, this is my water bottle, nobody else touches it. Um, it's common sense, but we get to where we're so used to being around people, we just, you know, high fives, and it's hard. I wanted to shake your hand this morning when you came in, but no shaking of hands, no hugging. You've really got to place six feet between yourselves. Um, study groups, college students love to be together studying. No, I mean, you're gonna have to use alternative alternative means. So at least we have Zoom and Skype and FaceTime. So you don't miss the social interaction, but you are being careful and protecting others. What about uh, hygiene for them and their residences? Okay, so apartment or residence hall. the question was about hygiene in either an apartment or residence hall. So now that you're socially isolated, well, not isolated, but quarantined, practicing, um, oh my goodness. Social distancing, thank you. Um, now's a good time to clean. So you're in your house, nobody likes to clean, but you know, spend a little extra time on the doorknobs. Stuff that we touch constantly, that germs are on, but we do not go through and wipe down all the time. So all the doorknobs, the handles, the sink faucets, just practice really good hygiene right now. Cell phone, yes, your computer screen your keyboard. Um, you mentioned the CDC expanded the, the high risk categories. Do you know off the top of your head what they added? The question was, as far as CDC's um, recommended groups where we could see an increase in severity of complications from COVID-19 infections. Um, initially, they started out with the sickest of the sick and the elderly population who were already at risk of infections due to a reduced immunity just from their age. Um, some of the others, most of the others came later once, and I believe that was last week when they issued um, their mitigation policy. So um, reaching out to businesses, um, institutes of higher education, uh, schools for K through 12, they, they then included those additional groups in that mitigation plan. So the question is, um, there have been sources and um, people have read that the COVID-19 virus cannot live in warmer surfaces. To my knowledge and to date, that has not been proven. And I was asked last week, how do we know moving forward into the spring and into the warmer weather, especially here in Louisiana, how will that affect um, positive cases? To our knowledge now, we are not sure. Um, data is coming in on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the best data we have is from the start of this thing in, back in January. Um, and so as we know more from a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, we may see trends, but at this time there's no way to tell. And the CDC is updating their information daily. So what I read last week, I kind of had to revamp because it's changing as we learn more about it. So a good thing is to keep yourself updated. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Once we make it to this point and the virus dies down, would this be a recurring thing every year, like the common cold? Would this be introduced to our, our way of life going forward? Like every, every year? Well, so the question was, um, will this potentially, as far as our permit, preventative measures and what we've seen this year with this virus outbreak, is this something that we could see on a year-to-year -year basis as far as preventative measures, social distancing? Um, from an immunology standpoint, and I'm not going to sit here and claim to be a virologist or any type of immunology expert, 
Um, but what we do know from previous uh, vaccine preventable diseases, particularly viruses, um, once we have been exposed, and this is not the only coronavirus that is out there, um, COVID-19 is one of several that humans are susceptible to. And so there are other coronaviruses that um, we experience with the common cold. There are also hundreds of rhinoviruses um, that are related that cause common colds. But the reason we don't see um, severe complications all the time from a common cold is because as humans, we've already been exposed to those um, viruses and been able to adapt and develop antibodies. So um, part of flattening the curve, as Dr. Wilcher covered, is giving us time as humans to react to this virus and, and be exposed to it in our bodies for most of our healthy individuals to start developing um, our own immunity and antibodies to this virus. And so potentially with the development of, that, of a vaccine as well as our human innate um, immunity, we could not potentially see this on a year to year basis or to this extreme. Of course, um, we should be doing these preventative measures year round anyway, not just during flu season or um, during a COVID 19 pandemic, um, but practicing um, cleanliness and um, hygiene on a regular basis. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question was, why was this so much more widespread than SARS, avian bird flu, and swine flu? So I do not know the answer to that. Um, I don't know. The, the only thing I've been able to see as far as why have these cases been worse and why is this pandemic, uh, because it's a novel virus, meaning brand new, we have not been yeah. exposed to this particular virus before. Um, and I hate to put it in similar terms to flu seasons that we've had before. Um, viruses evolve and shift, and not only can you have evolution of viruses within the same flu season, you can see total shifts where um, they're very smart and they can mutate. So what we have is an estimated guess yearly for our seasonal flu vaccine. Um, those viruses that make up um, different types of the flu virus, they can shift and morph completely into something. And so as a brand new, you see higher um, cases of positive flu, you see more severe cases within a season um, than other seasons. And so I hate to put COVID-19 into the same category when we talk about um, viruses and development and, and morphs, but that's really the only thing I have to, to compare it to at this point. And I think more data will be coming um, as we see changes um, in the morphology as well as the, the makeup of COVID-19 um, and where that could potentially put us in the future. So the question was, um, our viewer has seen posts and, you know, they don't think that it is a real virus or they're not, their friends are not taking it seriously. So for me, if I get COVID-19, it might appear as a flu. If I'm around an elderly person in my community, it could potentially kill them. So it's selfish of me to go out and continue doing the daily things that I want to do because this is what I do every day and nobody's telling me to stay home when I could potentially be putting someone that is vulnerable at risk. So the question is, there's no doubt in our minds that this is a made up emergency. No, because there are individuals that are sick there are individuals that are being tested, and there are individuals who have lost family members. And it's different when it's individuals in Washington State or New York, we don't know them, but there's people in South Louisiana who have lost family members. And if you 
I had a friend, a mutual friend on Facebook who knew one of the gentlemen and he, you know, the picture was shared. It brings it home when it is a face and someone, when they say a man from Kenner lost his life, other than, you know, somebody, not to negate the people's lives who were lost in Italy or other places, but when it's someone within the state, it brings it a little closer to home. So there's no doubt in my mind that this is real and there are people suffering. Um, at this time, they are increasing production of COVID-19 tests. Um, there is a rapid test that will give us results within 15 minutes. And I will, I had pulled up and I can give y'all an accurate number. And I forgot to repeat the question, I'm sorry. Um, as far as COVID-19 testing, um, there have been shortages, but have we seen an increase in production for um, our states across the, the country as well as Louisiana? And um, when will we have access? Are they ramping up those test availability? And so this morning I looked at our current um, states and locations that currently have offering of um, testing here. And as far as the, the CDC is concerned, as of evening of March 15th, they report 84 state and local public health laboratories across the 50 states and the District of Columbia. Um, we have six, in those areas, they've successfully verified COVID-19 diagnostic tests and are offering um, testing. And so those are only going to increase as the CDC um, makes those tests available and then authorizes more of our laboratories and diagnostic centers to provide those. I also have an update related to um, our the, the cause um, potentially or underlying conditions of some of the deaths we've had here in our state. Um, thankfully a colleague sent this information to me so I'm not going to um, claim credit for it, but two of our four deaths, they were from the same um, senior living center, and one was an 80-year-old and one was an 84-year-old. So again, this elderly population um, living in fairly close quarters when they're in assisted living or nursing homes, and prior to the reduction of visitors and, and no visitors as far as shut down to those areas, um, you know, family members, friends could have potentially um, brought that that virus in and shared, especially with our high-risk population. Okay, so the question was for people with um, comorbidities or immune suppressive disorders, how soon should they report symptoms or go to their physician? If you start having symptoms, peace of mind goes a long way. So if you are experiencing any symptoms, call your provider. Again, don't just show up because you don't know what other things you might be exposed to, but call your provider and get reassurance. And if they deem, because there is a checklist that you go through. So if you meet this, this, and this criteria, you will be tested for COVID-19. So they will go through that with you. But the main thing is for those who are immunosuppressed or have comor comorbidities is to stay at home and practice social distancing and proper hand hygiene. So that was when, if you go to the doctor and you're sick and they tell you, you know, call back if you're not feeling better. If you're not feeling better the next day, call back because sometimes with lung issues, it is going to progress and you don't want to, well, I'm not feeling that bad. 
Well, if you're already immunosuppressed and you're not feeling better, it will not hurt you to call the provider daily because there may be something additional. You don't want pneumonia to settle in. And I would add to that for, for young individuals who do have a common cold or what they believe is a common cold, it's very easy to brush off worsening of symptoms or to say, oh, it'll resolve on its own. It's going to get better. Um, I know of one friend through social media who is young, healthy, no underlying conditions, and actually was diagnosed with influenza. She had a positive case of flu this season that developed into a bacterial pneumonia um, and that was quite severe. And had she not reached out to her physician and been tested and had chest x-rays and, and found or was diagnosed with that bacterial pneumonia and gotten antibiotics for that bacterial infection, she could have been in the hospital and experienced even more severe symptoms. So um, it's important not to brush these things off. Um, but like Dr. Wilcher said, Louisiana Department of Health has these algorithms and checklists that all of our physicians and clinics, hospitals, they are using to assess patients for the potential of a COVID-19 infection. And they're taking all those calls um, very seriously to um, determine the best course of action and tell our patients to either stay home and protect themselves as well as other individuals um, or to come in for further testing and treatment. If there are no further questions, then we will conclude today's uh, forum on coronavirus, COVID-19. I want to thank all of you who joined us both in person and um, via our stream on YouTube. Again, to reiterate what our panelists have already stressed, please make sure that your first source of information is the CDC, which is updated regularly um, before necessarily um, believing other sources that you have read. And with that, I want to thank you all very much and have a wonderful day.